So welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for staying with us as we had uh, a few technical difficulties. It would not be a Zoom session if there weren't a few challenges as, as we start off. Um, my name is Greg Bowman. I am the Dean of uh, the Roger Williams University School of Law. Um, and thank you to this discussion today on a very important topic that is very upsetting and constantly in the news right now, which is the invasion um, of Ukraine. Uh, by, by Russia. I'm joined with some of my colleagues from the university, uh, two of my colleagues from the law school, uh, Professor John Chung and Professor Rena Gott, uh, and then from uh, the main university, uh, Dr. Sagan Donabed and Dr. Mark Sowalski. And we all bring different uh, perspectives to the subject of, of Ukraine and the crisis. And so uh, we hope that this is a, an informative session and discussion. Uh, we will try to leave time for questions at the end. And I should also say that um, the, the session is scheduled for between four and five, but um, if there are additional questions, uh, there are panelists who are going to plan to stay around uh, for uh, additional conversation after five o'clock. Um, it's a really important topic and we need to devote the time that we, that we have to it. So um, I'm going to start um, by introducing uh, my law colleague, Professor Chung. Uh, Professor Chung has a background um, in international law. I'll let him give some additional details uh, and provide us with a legal perspective on the, uh, the crisis in Ukraine. John? Uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, during our lifetimes, we've seen many armed conflicts around the world, but I believe that the situation in Ukraine is different and more concerning uh, than the others. And in order to um, explain why I reached that conclusion, I want to place the situation in Ukraine in a larger historical perspective and also uh, in terms of the perspective of international law. And with that, I wanna start with the preamble to the United Nations. The preamble to the, uh, the, the United Nations Charter, the preamble to the Charter, the, the, the United Nations was created in 1945 uh, as the war was uh, winding down. And the Charter of the United Nations was published after the war in Europe ended. And so this is, the, so the United Nations was formed in direct response to the end of World War II. And I'd like you to, uh, and I'd like to read the first words of the preamble, which says, we the peoples of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime has brought untold sorrow to mankind. So that's a reference to the two world wars that, uh, that were experienced in the first half of the 20th century. And it clearly uh, 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 demonstrates that the United Nations, the first and foremost purpose for its existence was to prevent another war like the first two world wars. And going on in, and going to article two of the charter, article two, uh, paragraph four says, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. So in other words, what Russia has done in Ukraine is a clear violation of international law. It is illegal. It is illegal under international law. I don't think there's any serious dispute uh, uh, about what the legal uh, 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 consequences of the situation are. And so I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to the fact that we start with the formation of the United Nations at the end of World War II. A few years later, uh, with the formation of the Soviet Union, the Iron Curtain came down and, uh, and NATO was formed in the late 40s. And NATO was formed as a response to the emergence of the Soviet Union. And NATO, as you know, is a mutual defense pact which calls for the defense of NATO members uh, if attacked by any party, but it was created uh, to protect the NATO countries in the event of attack by the Soviet Union. And so the, again, the purpose of NATO was to prevent war in Europe. And again, I wanna tie that to that uh, preamble in the United Nations, which demonstrates that the UN was formed to prevent war in Europe. And so then NATO emerged with the same aim. Now, in the 50s, the, uh, the, 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 the European Union 
the seeds of the European Union were planted in the uh, 1950s. What started out as a small trade group developed into what we now know as the European Union. And in the time from the 50s to today, one of the driving purposes of the European Union was to bind Germany so tightly to the rest of Europe uh, through trade and economics that Germany would never have an incentive to start a third world war. And the European was successful in that regard. Germany is a central uh, uh, a key uh, uh, member of uh, the European Union and is an active and, uh, um, and enthusiastic supporter of the vision of the European Union. So when you take a look at these three organizations, all of them shared the same purpose, the prevention of another land war in Europe. And for over 70 years, those three organizations working independently sometimes together at other times, uh, loosely coordinated at other, other times, managed to accomplish that. For over 70 years, these three organizations serve and accomplish their purpose, which was the avoidance of another land war in Europe. And despite the Cold War, th th it, the Cold War never became hot. It never became kinetic, as the term is now used. So this uneasy balance that existed between NATO and the Soviet Union, even under those circumstances, the goal of preventing another war in Europe was kept. And so all these parties, despite their various interests and often competing or hostile uh, interests, managed to maintain some kind of uneasy equilibrium, maintaining peace and stability in the continent of Europe. Now, there was an exception in the 90s with the Balkans, but that is more, that is an exception because that actually was not what an in international law is called an armed conflict of an international nature. Uh, I, I, that is a technical legal term, but it actually was not a war. And it actually was not a war of an international nature because it was mostly not a state versus state conflict. It involved irregular troops, paramilitaries, proxies, uh, uh, and uh, um, and so therefore, it it, it didn't it, it it doesn't fall within the category of a war between states, which those three organizations were uh, established to prevent. So they still managed to accomplish their goals despite what happened in the Balkans in the nineties. Now, what has me concerned today is that. For over 70 years, we, we've been able to say there has been a uh, uh, perhaps uneasy, but at least a, a stability and equilibrium preserving peace in Europe. We can no longer say that. The world has changed. We are now experiencing a land war in Europe. And it's because Russia chose to violate the most the left. Uh, fundamental principle of international law. Because All I'm seeing right now is, is John. I'm not seeing the whole group. I don't know why. And, he and, just... and even um, and, and and even during all these times of tensions between uh, Russia and the West, Russia at least made a pretense of the of observing international law and maintained the pre peace. That is all gone. And my fear is that we are now living in a different world and that the security structure of Europe has been dismantled by the action of Russia. And so that's why I say this conflict, I think, is different from all other armed conflicts since the end of World War II. And so my point is, is that this is not just another war this represents something different. And it's possible that the world may have changed uh, for the worse because of it. Uh, th thank you, Greg. Thank you, John. Uh, it's really interesting. My background is national security law and international trade. And when actors in the international realm stop acting like there are rules, even within the rules, there's a great deal of leeway, but even when they stop acting like there are rules, 
um, you end up in a really devolving, unstable situation. And that's, as, as Professor Chung said, so what we have here. Um, okay, I think we might have just lost um, Mark. He'll be back uh, in a few minutes. So why don't we turn to um, uh, Dr. Donabed from um, the university and Sargon, you, you, have, you have the virtual podium. Thank you very much, Greg. So I typically um, would be the one arguing for even more context, I suppose, as a historian um, or someone who works in the Department of History and, and uh, Cultural Studies. Um, but I'm really going to talk a little bit about sort of the, the human rights uh, catastrophe that we're seeing. So this, this situation of displacement and dispossession uh, of, of persons from the region. Um, this is something that, at least in my work, predominantly in work in the, the Middle East uh, and with Middle Eastern diaspora communities, we saw all too well, of course, uh, with the Iraq War of 2003, uh, the Syrian Civil War um, with ISIS, the advent of, of, the, um, of Daesh or ISIS in 2014. Um, which interestingly was concurrent with um, the previous invasion of, of Ukraine in 2014. So the, you know, these, these types of events ha have been happening where we have massive amounts of, of people moving from place to place, large masses of migrations. Um, as we know, it, currently in the Ukraine, uh, today there have been large attacks that continue to target civilians. Uh, many more Ukrainians are being displaced. Uh, estimated, we're at this particular point. The United Nations is a, is is warning that we're going to be at around five million people. Um, we're about at two million right now, um, just from Ukraine itself. So this is this is adding to about thirty one million worldwide, thirty one million refugees that we have worldwide right now. Um, folks are typically concerned. Any anyone working in this in this arena, but um, folks on the ground, of course, are very concerned with specific rising humanitarian uh, needs, both inside the country, but also at the borders. Uh, probably one of the biggest issues is of those people that are being displaced. Now, we've probably started to hear a little bit about this in the news, and, and many of you have seen this. And of course, there is absolutely uh, something that we probably have to talk about at a, a different conference, the sort of latent uh, racism that, that has exist in some of the, existed in, in many of the report, reportings uh, that have come out of the Ukraine recently. Um, and so that is absolutely a, a major issue. And part of it is, is the fact that Ukraine has had many uh, students from a variety of countries, uh, has a large student population from India, uh, from countries in Africa, uh, Lebanon. Uh, and also at the same time, there's a, a particular focus um, on, or let's say even a fear of folks that have already been, been displaced once in Ukraine are now being displaced again. So folks from Afghanistan uh, and Belarus who have already dealt with this level of displacement are now doing it a second time or being forced to do it a second time. So there are lots of concerns about that. And the general, uh, again, the sort of the general concern from, from everyone is uh, that it's also gender oriented too. So there's a, there's a major concern for women and, and children um, in particular, women and young young girls, uh, because many of the the refugees are women and, and and young girls who are leaving Ukraine, and we all, in anyone who's worked in the field of of migration and 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 refugee studies, know that women are the first to be targeted. Um, in women and children are the first to be targeted uh, in instances of violence and abuse and in particular exploitation. So uh, this is a major issue when moving through these countries from place to place uh, with the issue of, of um, it, it, let's say, uh, African students and Indian students, what sort of compounded a lot of, uh, a lot of the already difficult situation in uh, Ukraine of these refugees fleeing is that, of course, going to different Eastern European countries and, and even Western European countries they all have different rules and regulations, right? Different laws for people immigrating to those places. Now, some of those have been suspended. I mean, many of them have sort of been pushed aside. Uh, there's been arguments in many of these countries to say, it doesn't matter who's coming in, let them in at this particular time. But there are these discussions, these ongoing discussions as to who to let in and what types of, because of the, the, the countries that people are from. So if you're a student and you're originally from Nigeria or from India or from Lebanon, and you're going into one of these countries like Poland or Moldova or another country um, uh, that borders Ukraine, 
they're having these particular issues at the border. So um, that is a, an, an additional piece to all of this that, that's happening. So there's a, there's a constant sort of, there's a constant uh, situation of refugees in general. And then there are these, these smaller, more, uh, sometimes we think of them as more minute issues, but the reality is, is that they're just specialized issues that, are, that each and every um, displaced person is now facing. And of course, with all of that, there's this, there's this very, very strong worry as to where will these people be placed? Now, we've already seen with the displacement of people and the refugees from the Syrian civil war, there are many of these people that have been in refugee camps, camps for 10 years. They've been placed in these camps for, for 10 years. Um, regardless of what people think, uh, and, and again, uh, notwithstanding all of the, the ridiculous comments about uh, first world countries or third world countries, what's happening in Ukraine right now, I mean, the elimination of the infrastructure, that probably means that for many families, it's going to take quite some time for them to come back. So regardless of what the situation is as to what class people are, whether they are you know, of people of means or not of means, the, the fact of infrastructure, right? Not, not to mention security, of course, being the biggest one, but the infrastructure issue, whether or not these refugees can be brought back into the country and where are they going to go, right? If they're, the building has been de demolished or destroyed that they've lived in for years, where are you going to put these people? Um, it's a very real situation, a very real catastrophe. Uh, and it's, it's something that, again, it, it's sort of taken out of the context. So to, for me to go back to the context, I, I want to hopefully remind folks this other piece that, again, this isn't something new in a sense, because uh, I agree with, with, uh, with John stating that, you know, this is different in many, many ways. Absolutely. Um, but there were certain things that occurred in 2000, uh, in 2014, um, that essentially we started to see sort of an inkling of what could happen, what we're possibly seeing today, starting in, in, in 2014 and of course even earlier. Um, but we've been seeing this happening in a variety of different places and different countries around the world. And from a historical perspective, noticing places that you know, major, power, uh, major powers in the world are utilizing as proxies. I mean, this, this is exactly what we've seen in the Middle East you know, in my study area for at least the past hundred years. So in many ways, I see very, a lot of similarities as to, you know, uh, Ukraine being used and, and, and Mark and uh, I'm sure we'll talk more about this, but the Ukraine in many ways being used as, as, as this sort of border between, you know, these great powers in many ways. And a lot of times these conflicts play out in areas where there is the ability to have this proxy war, you know, where, where you're not necessarily as uh, the major powers are not as threatened and you can, uh, allow for some of this to, to occur. But regardless of all of that, you know, um, I, I always want to, rem again, remind folks about this, this issue of these injustices, you know, to quote uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, this injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. You know, why are we concerned? We're concerned because it's a very real humanitarian catastrophe. Um, and, and, and for someone, again, like myself, who studies this from a comparative nature, but also uh, my secondary degree is in animal studies. To understand um, people is also to understand their community and their connections. If you see some of the videos and some of the, um, the photographs coming out, even the, 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 the her more horrific ones from New York Times and Wall Street Journal and others, um, but in particular in the Times, you're noticing that a lot of people are fleeing with their companion animals. Um, this is a huge issue. So Imagine, uh, and, and it also has its issue within the framework of legality and international law, but also country law. So again, when you have a refugee family that has two cats, and we've seen many pictures of this, and they're walking into another country, many of those families are being stopped at the border and, and told, you cannot bring these animals in because there is a, there is a process. Um, they need to be checked. You have your paperwork. I mean, imagine requiring, of pe requiring people to have paperwork when they're fleeing for their lives, that they're going to pick up their their veterinary paperwork as they're running out the door or they're hiding in a bomb shelter in the subway. Um, so I think uh, one of the things I'd, I'd love to hear more of from, from other folks is, is the fact that, um, you know, in these times of crises, we have to sort of think of ways around these hard and fast laws and rules that we have to protect people, these very, very vulnerable people that need a space to survive, right? They need a space to survive and to move out of harm's way and, um, you know, there are families who've left, uh, I know this uh, after speaking with a, with a couple of folks who have family there, where folks have sort of sent their families across the border into other countries in Eastern Europe, 
while they have stayed behind because they could not have left their animals. So you're seeing this more and more, right? That the fact that we're, we're living in, and, and similar to folks not wanting to leave people that have been living with them from other countries, right? Because they cannot get across the borders. So you're seeing this, you know, the, the, the sort of the positives, the very, very real human nature, I think the very positive parts of human nature come across with the care of people not willing to leave others behind to move into these new situations um, because of the inability to do it uh, because of the, 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 the way that the, the countries have been structured to keep certain, um, to have these certain laws for immigration. So I think, you know, in these times of crisis, uh, my, my major hope is that we'll, we'll start to allow this to, to shift a little bit so that these people can find um, some sort of, of safety amidst the security crisis that they're living through. And I'll leave it at that. Great, thank you very much. Now you said that uh, 31 million refugees right now approximately, is that what you said, Dr. Donovan? To put that in perspective, that is greater than the population of every single US state with the exception of California, which is 39.6 million. So imagine, I mean, that, that 31 million is a big number, but it's it's bigger than 49 of the 50 states in the United States. It's, 10, it's almost 10% of the US population. Um, so, and, and, and I, I want to, I want to second your, your comments about community and about, uh, issues of race and gender. Uh, there are a lot of foreign students who are studying in Ukraine and they've had trouble getting out, um, if they are of a different uh, race or ethnicity sometimes. So it's been a challenge. Um, and that is, that's on, that is also an immigration issue in the countries to which they're, they're fleeing. Um, uh, so thank you again, uh, Dr. Sawowski. Um, I believe you are up um, and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say uh, from the context of international relations. And I'll put your maps up on the screen and you can tell me which ones you want to look at uh, as, as we go through your, your, your remarks. The Ukraine one first. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm going to try to, to talk about the overall conflict and um, I'm going to make five points for starters and then see where we go from there. Um, the first point I'd like to make is that I think it's clear now that, that Putin is seeking the, the subjugation of Ukraine, right? Um, and numerous observers have pointed this out, including the French president, Macron. And so this is much more than um, about Ukraine's neutrality um, or you know, getting them to commit not to join NATO. Um, secondly, uh, it, it's, 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 thank you, secondly, um, we're witnessing, uh, it's just depressing, terrible and unprovoked attacks on the Ukrainian people, including many, many innocent civilians. Uh, the Russians are um, making indiscriminate attacks on civilians. There's no military necessity in these cases. So this is a gross violation of international law and the 1995 Rome Statute established the ICC. Um, these attacks are getting worse. They're getting worse as the days go by, right? And as the Russians move in closer to key cities. And in particular, we're waiting for even worse attacks, you know, which Putin has done before, um, such as using a particularly horrible weapon called a fuel air explosive or thermobaric weapon, um, which is a weapon of mass destruction, which horribly takes out whole city blocks. Right, and Putin ordered these against Grozny and Chechnya as prime minister in 1999 and reportedly more recently in Aleppo. Right? Putin's objective here um, seems to be to destroy the morale of the Ukrainian people and to, and to bring horror um, um, to do this. Um, I have to say in this regard that, that um, I, mean, I just admire as we all think do um, uh, President Zelensky, but but um, I think he's their number one target, as people have said. And um, if, like, for example, that he's in a neighborhood, they're not quite sure where he is, destroy the whole neighborhood. And I think, you know, that's going to have a huge impact on Ukrainian morale. They'll rally for a while, but I think that will probably um, cause them to, uh, to, to be demoralized. Um, um, as videos also, as videos of, of such unspeakable crimes, um, are seen in the West, um, there's going to be tremendous pressure, more than we see now, on the U.S. and our NATO allies to take a more direct 
military action um, in, in Ukraine. And obviously this is very, very dangerous. And, and uh, it's a very important point, maybe one of the most important um, to discuss. Um, so um, uh, third, the heavy supply of weapons to Ukraine by NATO or individual countries or members of NATO also risks Russian attacks on supply lines, uh, which also uh, bring the possibility of a Russian-NATO conflict. Um, so these are very frightening um, 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 things. Um, fourth, I think from Putin's perspective, um, and um, you might want to see his speech at the commencement of his attacks on February 21st, Ukraine is not a legitimate sovereign state, right? It is not a legitimate sovereign state and its current government is described by Putin as corrupt and neo-Nazi, in particular, um, a government that represses those identifying in Ukraine as ethnic Russians. So for him, I think this is a humanitarian um, intervention, at least that's his public, public claim, right? Um, uh, However, the last census in Ukraine, which was in 2001, and if you could show the next picture, um, or, uh, the next map, I guess. Um, in the last census, which was 2001, that's great. Um, and they tried to do another one last year and they wasn't able to do it. Um, um, only 17% of the Ukrainian population identifies as Russian, as being Russian ethnically. I think that most people think it's a lot more, right? Um, and this included the Crimea back then, which is well, the, the most Russian person, people are, Russian identified people are in there in the Crimea. In most places in the South, Northeast and, and um, Southeast um, Russian, and this included Crimea, um, in most places um, people support, as you can see here, I, I don't know, if, can I, am I allowed, am, do you see my cursor here? Right in this area here, including the Donbass, you know, in the southeast, and then across to Odessa in the southwest, which many people in Putin uh, think of as sort of Russian ethnic areas, um, the numbers are actually quite low, right? In you know, from ten to thirty percent um, identifying as you know ethnic as ethnic Russians, and the evidence suggests that many, if not most, of these people prefer to live in independent Ukraine and not Russia, right? Uh, in 2014, after they went into Crimea, uh, for example, Moscow instigated uprisings in Kharkiv and Odessa um, as they had in the Donbass. But those uprisings was, were put down uh, by the local populations in both Kharkiv um, and, and um, Odessa, right? And, you know, I'm, I'm more than willing at some point, but not tonight, I guess, to discuss Russian claims to Ukraine. Um, but I think the critical point is not that you know, Russia's historical claims, which I think are somewhat tenuous, but what the people living there now, what the people living there now want today. Right? Um, fifth point um, is, is um, if the Russians are unable to take all of Ukraine, and I think the idea is to incorporate uh, UK, Ukraine to some kind of Russian Union, um, fe Russian Federation Union, like, and you'd have Russia, you'd have Belarus and Ukraine as sort of the three uh, Union states. Um, and then they'd each have their own president, but there would be a higher level of government, probably under Putin himself, um, is, um, is what's being considered. Um, and... Um, um, I fall back now is reportedly being considered. And if you could give me another next picture uh, or next map. And the fallback, uh, this is the Donbass, excuse me. And just to show you the Donbass in the Southeast, and also to note that even the areas in the dark, dark area here, you know, are, are, are under um, pro-Russian control, but the Donbass extends way beyond them. And these areas have, have, have re resisted you know, have resisted that control. If we could move a little next to the next one, um, you know, the fallback position, I think, um, if they don't completely subjugate um, Ukraine, and this map was put forward, I saw over the weekend, I monitor uh, some pro-Russian sites, or some blogs, if you will, and it was suggested that this was their fallback position. 
and you see that the, in this, it's, I know it's in Russian and it looks terrible, but but um, the red areas would be um, something, a place called Novorossiya or New Russia. And the idea was that they would incorporate these into Russia and that they would leave um, a rump Ukraine, which would be both the blue and the yellow areas. So this would be their fallback if they're not able to subjugate um, the entire place, right? Um, so, um, um, so I just think this is this is this is um, um, a, a war for the subjugation of Ukraine, and short of that, for the effective subjugation of Ukraine. Okay, and I think that's my time up. Thank you very much, Dr. Sulowski. And that brings us to my law faculty colleague, uh, Arena Gott. Professor Gott um, uh, has a personal tie to Ukraine uh, and um, we look forward to her remarks. Professor Gott. Thanks, Greg. I did see um, one of our colleagues' hands pop up during Mark's chat. I didn't know if we wanted to um, address the question now or hold to the end. Um, why don't we go through your comments and then we can okay. start we can start with, with um, Eliza Warburg. Sounds good. All right, so thanks everyone. Thanks again for being here um, on a late Wednesday afternoon. I'm, I'm gonna give you a little bit of, of my own background and then maybe share a couple of personal accounts that I've been hearing um, from close family friends who are still um, back in Ukraine. So like many, many, many uh, Jews. My family left Ukraine in, in 1979 when it was under Soviet control. So, you know, being born in Kiev is, is very central to my own identity and, and certainly to my story. You know, we all have those couple of things that we usually share with people um, that we meet and, and those are usually mine. You know, my name is Irina and I was, I was born in Kiev. So watching, um, you know, as I've said before, watching the entire world lens so focused um, on Ukraine and particularly on um, on Kiev has been very, very difficult. I, um, of course, remember Kiev through a, a five-year-old's lens. Um, I remember a one-room apartment. I remember it as a beautiful city with a, a great park we went to. It had a, pretty much everything a five-year-old could hope for. Um, I remember very loud, animated people who love to gather and celebrate loudly and a part of that culture we certainly continued here in the U.S. with our very extended um, circle of fellow immigrants. This conflict between um, Russia and Ukraine, if you could even call it a conflict, has been really, you know, a lot at the center of, of, of my identity identity confusion these past um, years. So growing up, um, I would tell people I was Russian born, but I also told them I was born in Kiev. And I often heard, well, so weren't you Ukrainian? I don't understand. Kiev is, you know, in Ukraine. And, and didn't you speak Ukrainian? Well, no, I actually grew up and still speak um, Russian. So you know, the short answer to that is the, the Ukraine that we left um, was a very different Ukraine than it is now, or, you know, I should say more accurately than it was a couple of weeks ago. Um, in 79, it was still, you know, as has been suggested, part of the former Soviet Union. So Russian was absolutely the dominant language, especially in the cities. Um, my parents explained to me that Ukrainian was sort of more the provincial language, um, and it was certainly not the language of academia academia and other prominent professions. Um, and of course, you know, that was that was Russia's influence there. So accordingly, you would only see Russian spelling of Ukraine, which you don't see as much anymore um, on maps and in books. And uh, the pronunciation was very different of, you know, Kiev back then than it is now. And so when we came to the US, um, you know, we were actually identified as Russian, which was very much a reflection of the Russian dominance in the Ukraine. But, you know, just as a bit of a footnote, I learned recently that that wasn't quite accurate either for us, because back then, um, Jews were actually separately identified um, in legal documents as Jewish, which may surprise you to learn that Jew Jewish was actually a, 
a nationality in the former Soviet Union. So it was in um, everyone's passport and it was a way through which the government um, implemented a lot of anti-Semitic policies, you know, show the passport, they would limit the amount of people who could attend universities, who got jobs. Um, and so that, you know, my dad, my dad would say, we, we grew up there knowing our place in society and um, we took it for granted that it, it was just the way things were. So it, it really wasn't until 1991, long after we arrived, in the US that um, Ukraine gained you know, some independence. And there, there was a real push, a cultural push to assert that independence in every way possible. And that included putting you know, the official Ukrainian language front and center after all those years. And um, that's essentially why now you'll see Kiev spelled differently, pronounced differently. Um, and that was, you know, that was a big source of <laughs> confusion for me growing up. And um, it's all too clear now. But I think what's been most striking um, for me and, and for my family over the past couple of weeks is, is really the, the amount of propaganda coming from Putin. I think, as someone previously mentioned, you know, just the way he's been using um, that he's been using to justify this human invasion, right? This whole idea of denazifying the Ukraine, um, especially as against a, a president who who's Jewish, you know, who had lost uncles in the Holocaust at a grandfather fight, um, who has said, how can I be a Nazi? I, I am Jewish. And, you know, Putin has essentially cut his people off from, from many forms of global communication that we take for granted. So I'm confident there are many out there, many Russian people out there who just have no idea of the reality of what their leader is doing, um, although hopefully many do now. And this is, you know, this is really the type of propaganda my parents grew up with, um, sort of this notion of the government justifying oppressive acts with, with pure fiction. Um, and it very much feels like Putin is fighting a war now um, in a way that the actual Nazis did, right? Um, so. You know, just to give you a sense, we we don't have any close family left over there. Um, a lot of them came over here after we did. You know, my grandparents are buried in Kiev. Um, my mom has very, you know, close childhood friends there. And we see a lot in the news about people fleeing. Um, and I think, you know, we talked about these sort of um, wartime decisions that people have to make. And the reality is that some people, including... Um, my mother's close friend made a very conscious decision not to leave. Um, she's older and, you know, at this point it, it, it's quite sad, but she she is resigned to, to staying there. She is resigned to whatever fate befalls her. Um, you know, for her to be a refugee at this point and to deal with the uncertainty of what that means um, seems worse than sort of taking her chances and staying there. Um, you talked about pets before, you know, there's another reality. She's kind of channeling her efforts to feeding some of the homeless dogs um, that are on the streets and the product of a lot of people having to make those really grueling decisions to leave, um, not just family, but, but pets. And we know those of us who have pets, those are, those are family members. So, and the other thing we're hearing a lot is just, you know, how young the Russian soldiers are and um, how absolutely horrified their families are, you know, and a lot of them didn't know what they were walking into um, and the reality that they were walking into. So all of this, all of these scenes we're seeing, you know, very eerily familiar um, of World War II, people leaving their homes, being separated, those horrid decisions people are making. Um, and, it, and it does all, it, it, it's hard to justify, it's hard to process because it does all seem like it's being done in the name of just, you know, as I said before, um, redrawing some boundaries on the maps and, and certainly just some ultimate human rights violations. Um, the last thing I wanted to say was just, you know, speak a little bit to the students who are here listening. Um, I've seen such an outpouring of concern and the, sort of this desire to act over the last couple of weeks. My students in our classrooms, we kind of all collectively started a Google Doc and started brainstorming ideas for different um, charities we could contribute to. and. Um, if these, you know, refugees make their way over here, there will be more direct ways we can contribute. Um, but I think one thing I wanted to say is, you know, I just want to encourage you all to just be, keep being active, but really be conscious and reject any, you know, acts of xenophobia you may be seeing. Um, 
especially towards the Russian people living here in the U.S. And that, you know, you all, we all know this tends to happen throughout history with our various citizens um, from abroad whenever there's some sort of conflict or something that happens. And um, there's been a lot in the news recently about people protesting Russian businesses in New York City. And, um, you know, some of this is very legitimate when we're trying to stand up to Putin and trying to cut off resources. But be really cautious and critical when you observe personal attacks on Russians living here and certainly attacks on um, small businesses in the United States, because that can, you know, that can be equally harmful um, to people living here as well. So keep it, keep doing what you do, keep advocating and, and um, thinking of great ways to contribute and effectuate some help and change here. That's great, Arena. Thank you. And that's a, that's a, that's a very important point to make. Um, the difference between a, a country and what it's doing and individuals who may be from there or affiliated with there, but who live here and are our fellow, our fellow residents and citizens. Um, I wanted to say one quick thing and throw up a map to put this in a, in a geographic perspective. And then we have a couple of questions that we can, we can turn to. Uh, the first is this, let me see here. Um, for those who... Um, Maybe not. May need a little bit of a refresher on on European uh, and Eurasian geography. Um, this is the Soviet Union as it existed when I was a child. Uh, there was no country of Estonia, no country of Latvia, no country of Lithuania. There was no country of Ukraine, and there were buffer states, satellite states that were nominally independent but were controlled, heavily supervised by the Soviet Union by Moscow. So Poland, uh, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. Um, and um, it was really a, a, a very uh, a Russian thing, and I'm, I'm generalizing, but the idea of having a, a land buffer between it and some of the Western powers. Uh, and of course, that, that also played out um, quite, quite graphically and tragically with the, the invasion of uh, the Soviet Union by uh, the German army in World War II, um, and only to be defeated by, by the weather. So there's this, um, and this is how things looked um, when the Soviet Union existed. And now this is more of how things uh, look from a, a Russian Federation perspective now. Bear, bear with me here. Um, I may need to um, I may need to find a different let's see here. I believe it's this. Nope. This, all right, this is a little small, but look, look, look at this now. We've got all these separate and independent countries, uh, former satellite states, former parts of the Soviet Union. You have an independent Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, um, Poland, all members of NATO. You have a unified Germany, member of NATO. You have, you have a, a, a Europe that is much closer to the doorstep of the Russian Federation. Um, so Ukraine is seen as part of a buffer and there is a lot of nationalism at play and being used by, uh, by Putin and his justifications. And a lot of it is, 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 is fiction. Um, but as, as Professor Gott said, I, I've heard reports of um, folks in Ukraine who have, have relatives in Russia who do not believe it's a war because of the censorship. Now, there's no war going on. There's no war there. I don't know. Everything's fine. So that, that's, a, that's a sort of distressing thing to, to, to think about. So we have a number of questions here. I'm gonna ask them and then open it up to the group. Uh, first uh, was, was Putin testing the West by going for, for Crimea first? Um, I, I, I can give a very long complex answer, which is one word, yes. Um, but I, but I, I welcome the thoughts of, of my fellow panelists. I think uh, Putin sees and the, most Russians see Crimea as vital to their interests. And, and um, if you take that away and you push them up, they kind of withdraw into the, into the heartland of Eurasia. And um, uh, I think um, that's one of the main reasons. I think Putin, he's been in power 22 years now. And I think he sees, he's looking for his historical, his place in history. And he's someone who's once again, like Catherine the Great and Peter, trying to you know put these lands together. And um, so. yes, 
Another question, uh, which which I'll answer uh, because it was my area of practice when I was uh, in, in law practice before becoming a law professor. Are economic sanctions going to be enough to deter further action from Russia? And I think the answer is no. Um, we have a limited number of cards that we can play. I've actually been quite impressed by the way the Western countries have expanded the conception of what a sanction can and should be uh, to cut off Russia's access to the international banking system, uh, to actually cut off Russian oil imports into the U.S., uh, and, and which actually has a lot of popular political support with, within the U.S., uh, to, to, to really find ways to, to expand um, the scope of already broad sanctions. And then you're seeing, you're seeing companies, including law firms, self-sanction, just pull out, even though they don't have to, and stop dealing with Russia. And that sort of, that sort of um, collective action above and beyond the limits of, of, of what sanctions do not allow you to do, I think it will impose a lot of hurt on the Russian economy. I do not think it will stop. Um, I think that there's the, 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 there needs to be a continued successful military resistance. Um, that perhaps combined with some of the cost and political unrest within Russia might stop that. But sanctions alone, no. Another question. I saw some reports that Putin announced the ruble will be back on the gold standard. Uh, if true, does this threaten to expand the conflict and exert pressure globally? I don't know if anybody has any, any thoughts Um on, on that. I think that part of that is a, I don't know, this is actually, I had not heard this one, so this is a great question. Uh, I, the gold standard, countries don't align their, their currencies very much anymore to gold. Um, that just that just invites inflation if people, if you find more gold um, and, and the, the dollar has value because we say it has value because the U.S. government backs the value of that piece of currency, but there's nothing, there's no gold or anything else sitting behind it. This seems to me to be something that might just be a political statement, or it might be that maybe that could perhaps provide value to the currency in the absence of having any backing within the, the international financial system so that um, it may, it props up the value of the ruble. I have no idea how successful that, that will be, um, but I, I think it'll. I think it's a reflection of the, the feeling of isolation um, that 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 Russia is being placed in because of the sanctions and people and companies ceasing doing business with it. Seems like an act of desperation. It um, certainly it certainly smells that way. Yes, I think what we're trying to do here, if we can put economic pain on Putin's inner circle. And those are not really oligarchs. These are people who surround Putin who are basically from the secret police and other kind of strong men. And I think that's the contest. It's between the morale of the Iranian people and if we can put pain on his, his inner circle and that they might make a move against him um, because they see their riches and stuff being, being lost. But Russia's in no hurry here. Time is on Russia's side, I think. I think I think that's right, and it's it's really unprecedented to have a nation this integrated into the world economy be cut off in this way and have sanctions imposed directly on the leader. Um, it, it's a it's a really stunning and stunningly quick development. There have been a lot of conversations behind the scenes to make that happen, but it really has, as as I think Dr. Swalowski said, it's it's re emphasized to us and underscored the importance, and also uh, Professor Chung, the importance of NATO, uh, the European Union, and our alliance with with uh, the powers of Europe. Can I jump, can I just mention something really quickly? Absolutely. Um, I, uh, I was thinking about this just recently, um, something I wanted to go back to with Irina's comments earlier. Uh, some of my students had asked this about, you know, placing this again in the historical context and asking about something that you had put up and Mark had spoken about as well. Uh, just sort of seeing where the, these dividing lines are between people, by, between, you know, sort of quote unquote Russians and quote unquote Ukrainians um, and sort of uh, how people view themselves and what they think of themselves and, and looking at that sort of ethnic divide. Um, and then looking at emic and etic discussions, right? The idea that, you know, this is the, the insider way of saying something. Yes, Ukrainians are saying this, whereas Russians are saying that. And frequently people will say, um, well, if we, if we go back 20 years, you know, as Irina, you were saying this issue of, well, people call themselves Russian. And so there, was, there is this sense of, well, yes, there is that internal understanding as well. That was an emic understanding. But I just wanted to bridge, bridge some of that. And it's something I have to tell my students frequently. 
all of these emic understandings, because we live in a global society, are influenced by etic understandings or, or in knowledge production or something along those lines. If you want to think of knowledge production, if you're educated in a Soviet school that's pushing Russian ideas, as Irina was saying, then of course you're going to see things in a very different light, right? And, and uh, during those formative years of your, of your upbringing, that is what you're going to feel and think and, and, and how you're going to act, right? You're not going to speak Ukrainian, you're going to speak Russian. So that is a major piece. And so does context play a role in all of this? Yes, absolutely. And, and yet there's no, there's no way you can sit, sort of dismember this and take one piece out from the other and say, oh, well, let me look at this in isolation or in a vacuum. I think that's, you know, it, it, to go to what folks have been saying and questioning about how is this going to affect things? Well, I mean, to assume that as Mark was saying, you know, with thinking about sac- sanctions, you and uh, Greg, you and Mark have been mentioning, I mean, talking about stopping natural gas, Right? What's that going to do to Europe? But also, what about what about wheat prices? Now, is you know, should we we only be concerned about the uh, economic impact? I would say no, based on the humanitarian issue. Yet at the same time, look at countries that are going to be severely affected by, like for instance, I mean, places like like you know, in, in my area of the world, if you're looking at Lebanon and Syria that depend on wheat exports, right? How are they going to get those wheat exports? Um, if everything is sort of closed off from Russia. Um, and, and interestingly enough, also the Ukraine is a big wheat exporter, right? So, exactly. and, and so this is another piece of that. And I, people tend to think these things only work in isolation. They don't. We're, we're playing a, a very difficult, I mean, I think everyone's playing a very difficult game. And um, I, 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 don't, I don't know what to say, but I think reminding ourselves that this is, that all of these things are interconnected and um, is very important to, to recognize. I just apologize for running that little piece there, but I just wanted to make sure I said it. It's, it's complicated and complex. Um, it's complicated. So we have a great question about China. How do we see China situated in this war? What might we see? Uh, there actually have been some fears that the, the Sino- um, Russian alliance that President Nixon feared was was coming into being. I think that might be not true. But anybody, anybody have any thoughts on 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 China and how it how it plays into this conflict? I'll just make this observation: um, China and Russia are not natural allies. I think that as of today, they have a coincidence of interests which is limited to this situation. Mm -hmm. But they historically have had uh, frosty relationships. And what unifies them right now is uh, the United States. They have a common uh, adversary. But it's not a natural alliance. And so uh, from my point of view, I'm really not concerned that China is going to backstop Russia uh, or uh, tip the scales in favor of Russia. China has no interest in doing that. Right now, they just have a coincidence of interests. And next year, it might be different. And so right. um, I, 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 I think that um, I, I, I don't view it as I don't view it as the emergence of uh, the the Russian Chinese alliance that may have been feared at one point. They have completely different interests. I read a very interesting piece this morning. I believe it was in the New York Times talking about uh, how this has made China's uh, world uh, influence strategy much more complicated. That China thrives in peace and stability because they can expand their economic influence and grow their GDP, uh, and that perhaps Russia, which is heavily dependent on oil and gas exports thrives in instability, which drives the prices of those commodities up. And so there, there's, there's not a lot of pleasure in Beijing about the, the current state of affairs. And apparently they were, they were, they were caught as off guard uh, as the West was uh, when, when Russia invaded, invaded Ukraine. That is on the verge of, of ending term limits in, 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 in the fall as Xi is going to become kind of president maybe for life. But, and there's some talk and in, in you here in China now, maybe we don't want to do that. Look what happened to Putin. He's there 22 years. And, you know, maybe we need to have, and there's, there's, they don't want to get too close here, I think. I think in any kind of alliance situation, um, 
Russia would be the subordinate party, and I don't think the Russians would ever take that. that that's very interesting. And what was it, 30 years ago, uh, the economies of China and uh, Russia were about the same size, and now China is 20 times the size of, of Russia in terms of its GDP, which is really stunning. Uh, other, other questions here. Um, we're running over a little bit over five. Uh, I will have to leave in a minute, but we can continue the conversation and I will turn over the helm to one of my good colleagues here. But a couple more questions here. Um, what leverage does the UN have and can Russia be kicked out of the Security Council? <laughs> You know, I think I think we're looking at you. I think we're looking at you, John. You used to work uh, at the UN in Geneva. The UN has no leverage, and if Russia is kicked out of the U Security Council, which won't happen, then the United Nations will cease to exist. Period. Yeah, it's really interesting that 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 Russia is a permanent member of the Security Council. They don't rotate. It, it was it. it and it, it was deliberately designed that way. It sure. was the Security Council was meant to be occupied by the, uh, the World War II victors. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as a member of the Security Council, Russia can prevent any action uh, by the UN, which is why the UN cannot, uh, will, will, will not get involved in this. Now, the UN will get involved in humanitarian efforts. But in terms of uh, any sanction against Russia or, or, or you want action against Russia, it, it's impossible uh, for it to happen. Right. The General Assembly can pass a resolution and they have done so, with, but that, that doesn't have the, 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 the force of authority that the, the Security Council does. No, it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's at most a symbolic uh, gesture. Right. So let me see here. Do you think that Russia will invade other countries as well? And if so, which ones? Anybody want to be want to be adventurous? Look into your crystal ball there. I would not want to be in Moldova in the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. It's it's sort of a small country down in the in the southwest, and then they're coming across through a, Odessa, which cuts off four ports. That's their main ports, and that's their food exports and stuff. That really just really hurts. And then if they keep going, they just take Moldova, which is not in NATO, and it's a former uh, republic in the Soviet Union. Right. There's about one you know, part of Moldova along the Dniester River to the east. There's, there's still Russian troops that remain in there from the, the days of the Soviet Union. So they would link up with those. Right. I'm also worried about the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia. Lithuania, but there they would be hitting NATO. Um, I don't think they're considered vital to us, but they're in NATO, and Biden has made it very clear, not one inch. And I, and I bet they take some comfort in the fact that they were able to get that done um, before there started to be a, 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 a great amount of possible pushback from, from Russia on that. I was worried under Trump that Putin might be take, a, take a shot at Estonia and that President Trump wouldn't honor the NATO commitment to Estonia because it's not vital to us. And once the U.S. doesn't honor its commitment to NATO, NATO really uh, loses its strength. Yep. I'm surprised he didn't do that, actually. But Biden's right. a different, different. Right. So uh, final question before I, I turn it over to, to uh, my fellow panelists. If time is on Russia's side, does this mean he isn't likely, uh, Putin is, isn't likely to turn to nuclear weapons as a show of force, or is, is this a realistic concern? I'll say, you know, I think as long as things stay stable and clear, um, I think it's probably unlikely, but that's, that's the challenge of these situations. Nobody in 1918 thought that we were getting into a world war. Um, and it, there was no intent by the Allies to get into a world war, World War II. So it's, it's instability and, and the, 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 the interweaving web of security commitments across Europe in 1918 is what led to World War I. Um, right now, things are a little bit more um, uh, two-sided or bilateral where you've got NATO and Russia, but it, there's, there's still this potential. What if, what if, what if um, there's an incursion into Poland? What if there is an incursion into Estonia? I mean, what happens then? And I'll say final, final comment is part of what I think the West is trying to do quietly 
uh, without putting it on the front of the papers is is figure out ways to give Russia an out so that they can stop and save face and limit the losses or even push them back without making it look like it was just a complete defeat. It's, 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 it's when Putin is cornered that I think there are concerns. Uh, but if, if things can stay internally stable and they can back down and back off, I think that's the outcome um, that people are hoping for. But that might be, as Dr. Swalski put up on the, sc- on the screen, you know, that, that, might mean, that might mean a carved up Ukraine which would be a terrible result, perhaps, but perhaps better than, than complete annexation. I don't know what else. I'm worried it's going to get very horrible. And when we start seeing like whole city blocks reduced to zero and, and um, we haven't seen the video at Mario Paul, we're starting to see some videos. And I just think people are going to put pressure on their governments to take stronger action. You think that will destabilize things and make nuclear weapons more likely? Yeah. If, if, uh, if like we start doing a, uh, a no-fly zone over Ukraine and we're something like that, sure, that puts us right in direct con- conflict with um, Russian airplanes and surface-to-air stuff. Which is why, which is why the Biden administration and other Western powers have not done so. Right. And in fact, just today, uh, the U.S. nixed a plan for Poland to give older MiG fighter jets to the U.S. Uh, at, at Ramstein, at the Air Force Base there, to give to... Uh, Russia, the U.S. has tried to play a behind-the-scenes role so that, so that this cannot be characterized by Russia as a U.S.-Russian conflict. So, but it remains to be seen whether Poland will provide those. And if that, but even there, I think that, that would be incredibly destabilizing. I just hate to say this, but I just think it's going to get really horrible. Um, you know, really horrible. Yeah. And I'm sorry I read it, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so when somebody asked about tactical nukes, um, are those on the table? I don't think they're off the table. Uh, Lisa, I have a question for you. Are others on the panel able to see the uh, Q&A? Okay. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go blank, um, and I will let all of you continue to have the conversation. I want to thank everybody for attending. I want to thank my university colleagues, Irina, John, Sargon, and Mark, for this conversation. Um, I read a lot about this. Uh, I have a background in this and I always learn from these, these conversations and the perspectives. Um, and, and so this has been, this has been great. So uh, an unfortunate, sad topic, but, but great. So thank you. And, and uh, I will look forward to seeing everyone soon. Thank you for Thanks, convening. Greg. Absolutely. Thank you, Greg. I do see a question. I don't think we answered about, um, uh, someone asking about the extent of the cutoff of the information to the Russians, whatever happened to shortwave radio. And I, I think I did just see an article a couple of days ago um, about the BBC resurrecting shortwave broadcasts to reach Russians. So that was like a May, uh, March 7th article, I believe, if you want to Google the BBC. So I guess there's uh, that's something. What else? Anyone seeing any other questions we haven't answered yet? Rather than the nuke weapons, what about some dirty nuke from the captured power plants? What What I would say about nuclear weapons is that it's a red line. If there's really, there's, it's it's not going to make a difference whether they're strategic weapons, tactical, battlefield weapons, or dirty bombs. Nuclear weapons are in a class of their own militarily. They're in a class of their own under international law. It is a bright red line. If nuclear weapons are used, the world will change forever and we'll never go back to where it was. It, it, it's, it's simply unthinkable to entertain the concept that it could be happen, that, that it could happen. We will all be affected and our world as we know it will not be the same. So uh, that's my greatest fear. 
yeah. in all this. And I should say there was a, a clarifying comment here. Um, I'm not talking weapons, I'm talking accidents similar to Chernobyl was the clarifying comment. Well, that's a concern too. I mean- uh, I, I, the, Deliberate accidents. Yes, I, 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 I have thought about that. Uh, Putin is savvy. I mean, he could engineer, construct uh, 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 a deliberate release of radiation and have plausible deniability that he's uh, engaged in uh, um, nuclear warfare. But that's a possibility because I've wondered why are the Russians so obsessed with taking over these nuclear power plants? I, I don't know why, but clearly there's a reason for it. And the possibilities, the worst possibilities scare me because it is a way that perhaps Putin may be able to disguise the open use of nuclear weapons under the guise of so-called accidents. And so I, I don't know, I don't know if that's what they're thinking, but I mean, I, my guess is that if, if it pops into my uninformed head, I'm sure it's popped into the, uh, um, uh, the strategists uh, um, running uh, this war on behalf of Russia. Just if I could on the nuclear weapons question, I think on both sides, there's a general feeling that if we were to use nuclear weapons, it would not be a rational process. It would be something that we did because inadvertently, like, and I think from the Cuban Missile Crisis forward. And, and so the way we sort of lose control of the situation and it goes up. So, you know, since, well, since the Cuban Missile Crisis is 62, we put a lot of effort into trying to keep our forces separate because if they come into contact, what can happen? And, um, and, uh, and right now it's about the closest we've been that I can think of in, in a while. We did set up a deconfliction line and we have experience with that. So like in Syria and other places, we have our military talks to their military. We have, you know, you remember the hotline, but that's so much more advanced now. And we have professionals, they've been doing that all their lives, trying to sort of be asked questions. So we understand what they're doing. They understand what we're doing. So there's no, no miscalculation. But in this situation, I think it's, there's plenty of places that it could, it could we could lose control of it. So it'd be in it. Sorry. Another question asks, and um, stop me if we've already answered this one. What happens if India becomes somehow involved? Did we address that one yet? Or engages on the Russian side? Any thoughts on that? India has a long-term historical relationship with uh, Russia in terms of particularly military um, uh, equipment and, and they buy a lot of their weapons from Russia. There's long standing ties there, but India, has been taking steps towards the United States. And just recently we have this thing called the Quad, which is India, uh, Japan, Australia, um, and the United States. So, and, and uh, we're, our, our security cooperation is more and more. So I, I'm not sure they would take the, I know, I think they, didn't they abstain? Do you know, John, or are they? Yes, they, they abstained on the, on the vote to sanction Russia. And uh, um, India has to be careful because India's greatest threat is China. Absolutely. And so the reason why uh, India is uh, sort of friendly towards Russia is because they both have a mutual adversary in China. I mean, India and China have already engaged in uh, deadly skirmishes uh, regarding the border, uh, regarding their border. And so India needs friends uh, it, with respect to its uh, um, a relationship with China, which uh, draws it towards Russia, but also draws it to the United States. So India is has to walk a tight uh, has to walk a tight rope here but it, 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 india it would be in it would be against india's interest to throw its lot in with russia because uh, it'll lose the united states Irina, can i ask uh, mark and john a question too do, what well, do you guys course. think <laughs> what do you guys <laughs> no what way. do you guys <laughs> well i was thinking about 2014 and what brought the parties to the you know, to the table in 2014. Um, how do you see, you know, what, what are the distinctions between 2014 and today? I mean, we know there are obvious, very, very obvious distinctions, I think, but I think a lot of times this is sort of lost on, on a lot of us as to um, the fact that, you know, there was an issue in 2014 uh, where Russia was supporting rebel groups, yet there was, you know, the, the Minsk Accords or the Minsk Agreements that came out of that. So, 
Um, could you, could, do you guys see a, or, or really how did that go well in a sense, right? Where, where there was a de-escalation, whereas, you know, this, this is a bit different, or is there a possibility of that actually something like that occurring again? If I can, I think they were much different objectives in, in 2014, and, and they were pursuing a model of confederation, you know, within Ukraine, they would keep Crimea, but the Donbass would be brought in in a kind of autonomous fashion. And, and in fact, they had discussed this idea of Nova or Russia, you know, coming down and, and, and reasserted that in 2014, but then they dropped it and they, they, they just dropped it to go into the means process. Um, and, but that's behind them now. <laughs> they, their, their objectives are much greater right now. And I think a lot has to do with, with Vladimir Putin. In fact, he's been there 22 years and he's, people I know and who follow that closely are saying he's looking basically to get, get out a bit. And he's going down and thinking of his historical role as the person like the Catherine and the Great and Peter who gathered the Russian lands, you know? And that's very frightening. Yeah, I think going back to 2014, my view of Crimea was that it seemed like the world just acquiesced in the annexation of Crimea. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't a, a robust response from the West. And, you know, the question that leads to the question, well, did that encourage Putin somehow? But, but certainly it, it, was, it was a quiet response from the West. I mean, of course the West objected, but, but there, there wasn't much strength to it. It's also interesting the relationship between the US and Russia in the Middle East, because when ISIS was um, active, uh, there were times when the United States and Russia were actually working together. So, it, I mean, it was, it is, it is it, you know, like I, I know a little bit about, I, I think I know more about the Middle East than most people because my work at the UN uh, involved the Middle East. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, what's interesting about the Middle East is that it is so complicated and so entangled. And so you have situations where at times the United States and Russia are act are, were actively working together while at the same time, you know, also being adversaries on the ground at the same time. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I think just, uh, I, I don't want to switch the focus too much, but I think people would be surprised that Israel and Saudi Arabia are actually secret allies. Uh, I think that would surprise a lot of people, but that's just the nature of the relationships in the Middle East. And, and I think that goes to the complexity of, 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 of how the U.S. and Russia were uh, dealing with each other because there were so many moving parts um, you know, as you said, everything is so interconnected and, and, it, and you can't just isolate one thing from the other because, because everything is so interconnected and, 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 and you know, it, it, people are trying to coordinate all these things at the different time. And it, it's, I, I think it must be fascinating trying to, trying to uh, um, uh, 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 develop strategy uh, uh, or policy uh in, in these sorts of things because because the issues are so complicated um it, it's fascinating uh, and the, uh, they, those are deeply connected too right john in the sense that um saudi arabia and uae although they are u.s uh close close with the united states i mean both of them did they not um abstain as well in their, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, I, I don't remember, votes. but I saw a headline today that they refused to take uh, Biden's phone call. Yeah, yes. And, so. Israel, and Israel at the same time sent um, uh, the prime minister to speak directly to Putin. And, and, and I, I, I mean, I'm assuming a lot of this also has to do with the, the, uh, the deal with um, Iran, right? This yes, sort of exactly. this... It, it, yeah. I mean, the deal with Iran is is an inseparable part of what's happening in Ukraine now mm -hmm. uh, because of the oil. I mean, it is. It, it, I mean, an event like this is so. I, I think. I think. I think. I think it is impossible for human beings to to fully map out all the consequences of an event of this scale, um, and um, and we 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 have no idea. We probably only have access to maybe two percent of what's actually happening right now, and we're just trying to, you know, come to conclusions based on such limited information uh, to the best that we can. But um, I, I mean, who knows? Who knows? 
it, it, it's this whole thing again with this whole thing of trying to fi finalize the uh, the Iranian nuclear deal. It is it is completely tied to Ukraine now. Uh, so again, it's it, it, really interesting that way. I sense that the UAE and Saudi Arabia. I've been told that major effort now in the Security Council to declare the or res resolve that the Houthis, I may be mispronouncing that, but in Yemen, yes. um, to declare them as terrorists. And and uh, that was the pressure that was put on Saudi Arabia and well, UAE is on the Security Council right now. And, and that's why they didn't go along. So throw that out, it's another yeah. bit of complexity. In Ex yeah, exactly. There's something in the chat about um, seeing the first stories of Ukrainian soldiers being captured by the Russians. And the question is, do you think there will be many POWs similar to what went on in Afghanistan? Well, um, th th I've, one of the interesting things is, is that, first of all, I don't know how, uh, I don't know if this falls with, uh, under the umbrella of, of pro propaganda but um a lot of the wars on tiktok and uh, um and 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 i watch hours of tiktok videos each day about the war and one of the things i've seen is that um when the ukrainians have captured russian soldiers uh they've allowed them to call home the the, the captured russians have called their parents and said i've been captured and uh, um uh, uh this is where i am and, and, and so, obviously, those those videos were released by the Ukrainians to influence public opinion. And I'm not saying, and, and I'm not trying to downgrade uh, the uh, uh, the humanitarian um, uh, 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 appeal of that or, or or the kindness of that. Uh, but uh, um, you know, it, it, Ukraine released those videos because it serves their purpose. But I I hope that those are accurate depictions because it is a kind gesture to allow the POWs to call their parents and say, I've been captured, but I'm alive. And, um, and I hope that it, for Ukrainian prisoners of war that the Russians show the same sort of uh, 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 fair treatment. Um, but again, that's, we're still, we're still in the middle of seeing all that unfold. I think there's a lot more free information in the in in Ukraine as well, right? So we're seeing a variety of different things come out of Ukraine, but from various outlets, like you're saying, John, like TikTok and other places. I think again to go back to what what pretty much everyone has said. I think the hard part in Russia is that you're you're now you've now sort of downgraded to, I mean, what one one source of information, one outlet, one inlet, one outlet, which is vastly distinct. I mean, you you don't have you know, Elon Musk's uh, satellites allowing you to, you know, send out all sorts of information uh, under a variety of different channels versus, you know, one state-run channel or a couple of state-run channels. So I'm sure that that plays a, I, I mean, for me, you know, if I was going to make a distinction, I would say that I feel a little bit more confident that that there's a little bit more freedom of of, of uh, information, ex sort of, if you want to think of it, expulsion outside of the, the um the country of, of Ukraine versus uh, Russia, I think at this time, I, and I could be wrong, but that's that's simply is my feeling at this time. Well, there's still reporters on the ground in Ukraine, uh, as opposed to Russia, where a lot of news organizations have withdrawn their reporters. Another question I don't think we had gotten to. Um, it's clear the unlawful invasion of Ukraine has been planned uh, by Putin for years. Trade economic sanctions have proven to be ineffective. A ban from SWIFT is not working. We see escalating civilian casualties, refugee crisis. Based on historical perspective on wars, history of Russia as a global power with China as an ally, what is the next move to end this? What is the likelihood of Ukraine agreeing to remain neutral? independent state, one of several demands that Putin has made. Well, I would just echo what Greg said, which is, I, I think that just from a rational policy-making point of view, the Western powers need to give Putin a graceful exit out. He, he they he cannot be humiliated 
if 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 what he's offered or if his option is humiliation, I think he'll just escalate this. And so I don't know what the graceful exit is, but I'm sure the diplomats, I mean, that's what they do for a living. That's what they're expert at. I'm sure the diplomats are trying to figure out a way that gives uh, Putin some sort of uh, um, cover uh, to try to end this. Uh, the headlines today, and I'm just talking about today, who knows, they could be completely different tomorrow, is that the headlines today seem sort of conciliatory on both sides, uh, that, that the rhetoric seemed to be softening a bit. But that's just today. I mean, I have no idea uh, what will happen tomorrow. And I believe today, I think the foreign minister of uh, Russia and the foreign minister of Ukraine are meeting in Turkey today. So, and, and uh, I, I, I haven't been able to check the news, so I don't know if uh, anything of, uh, if anything newsworthy uh, occurred as a result of that. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I, after this is done, I'm gonna check the news to see if there is any news out of that uh, meeting today. I think Putin is um, looking to subjugate Ukraine and his backup is to sort of take over Russia, the whole red area in the map I put up. And I don't think he's looking for any any way out of this. I think he's intent, at least right now. Um, and I think these negotiations, I teach negotiations too. And there's an, there's an idea that you negotiate for side effects. You're not really negotiating to come to an agreement, but you know, because you need to do that for public opinion reasons and other kinds of things. Right, I, I I agree with that completely, and and that's and perhaps that's what all these perhaps that's just what these negotiations are, um, nothing substantive but uh, um, a spectacle. I I, I I'm completely uh, uh, open to the to that possibility. I mean, they did negotiate some humanitarian corridors out of Mariupol. There were four corridors or four attempts to do that. And I heard on NPR, the deputy mayor of Mariupol, which is down on the Sea of Azov, which is taking a terrible beating. And on each of the times that they started to move, the Ukrainians moved people down those corridors, the Russians shelled them. Yes, yes. So, I mean, you know, what are you going to do? Someone's asking if you have any thoughts about why Russia uh, is choosing a ground war instead of air. Is it a money issue? Well, I, I'm not a military expert, but um, I follow armed conflicts, uh, I would say, as an informed lay person. And uh, if, if, you want, if you want to occupy a country, and as Mark, as you say, subjugate, you cannot do it from the air. You must have troops on the ground. And so it, 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 an operation like this cannot be conducted uh, uh, simply as an as an air war. I would agree. What is the policy of a high altitude blast over own territory rather than attack on another sovereign? Well, it, I mean, it, it is a weapon of mass destruction, and um, it's. Uh, I believe it is the. Uh, it is the final weapon that can be used short of nuclear weapons. And so there have been rumors that one has already been used in Ukraine. I, I don't think the media has been able to verify it, but it's just Russia coming close to the nuclear line without crossing it. Uh, and that would be the purpose of using a weapon like that. see what we haven't gotten to. Um, oh, a comment. My, my informed military export says that air is too expensive. <laughs> um, what else? Again, stop me if, uh, if I'm repeating. How much of this war is, is steeped in larger issues of being ethnically Russian? Have we answered that one yet? Due to Kiev being the seat of the old proto-Russian state of the Kievan Kiev and Rus, must Kiev be recaptured for Putin to achieve his vision of a reunited Slavic people or to complete the imitation of Catherine or Peter the Great? The, the Ukrainians don't want, to, don't want to, they want to be independent, I think. So they're not looking to join with them. 
I th Mark, I think uh, what I'm wondering if Nick's also asking is, uh, is this also about the issue of um, maybe this is going back to what you mentioned with with Putin, right? Wanting to whether or not the Ukrainians want this, him wanting to, you know, retake the old seat of the Kievan Rus that he's mentioning here, right? Sort of sort of going in. So although the Ukrainians don't want it, you know, I think I think Nick's asking, and I could be wrong. You know how much of this uh, is Putin wanting to sort of reunite that? And I think you mentioned that that that's what you see a lot of, right? Is that sort of wanting to leave that historic mark to go back to the sort of this grandness? But if I remember correctly, the Kievan Rus were also there were also Finns that were connected to the the Kievan Rus yeah. and and the Khazars and other. I mean, it was very there, you have a Slavic entity, but you also have non-Slavic groups as well. So I think. Um, I mean, largely, I think this this seems to happen frequently, where um, you know the, we go back to the grandeur of history and and but tend to forget some of the pieces. Uh, but I don't think that matters to Putin, right? I mean, if he's if he's intent on it, he's intent on it. It's not. There's no way to justify it. Yeah. So we're right at five thirty. Um... And uh, I think we may let our panelists go and grade some papers or something. <laughs> Eat some dinner. No, no. <laughs> but um, Lisa, right? 5.30, we are going to kind of call it. So, um, yeah. So I guess I'll, I'll wrap up and say thank you. Okay. To everyone for coming. Thank you, Lisa, for organizing. And um, thanks everyone for, for being here, for giving your time to this. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.